Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of praise. God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread. Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the book of Acts. Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you just crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other disciples, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified, 
with many other arguments and exhorted them saying, save yourself from the corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized and that day about 3,000 persons were added. The word of the Lord. We will be reading Psalm 116, responding at the half verse. I love the Lord because he has heard the voice of my supplication. Because he has his ears to me whenever I call upon him. The cords of death entangled me, the grip of the grave took hold of me. I then I called upon the name of the Lord. How shall I repay the Lord? For all the good things he has done for me. I will lift up the cup of salvation. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord. It is the death of the servants. O Lord, I am your servant. I will offer you the sacrifice of the thanksgiving. And call upon the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all his people. In the courts of the Lord's house. In the midst of you, Jerusalem. Hallelujah. A reading from Peter, First Peter, that is. If you invoked as father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without defeat or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls, by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love. Love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in all Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. And so he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. My liturgics professor at seminary used to say of the altar that it's a table like any other table, and at the same time, it's a table unlike any other table. If you think about it, that kind of makes sense. We set the altar... We put food on the table, then we eat off the table, and yet when we pray, when we ask God to bless the gifts, when we break bread together, something happens. Something changes what this table is, what it represents, and something changes who we are. What was once ordinary becomes outstanding and exceptional. That's the framework that I'd like for you to keep in the back of your mind as we reflect together this morning on this beautiful story that is the road to Emmaus. Former Archbishop of Canterbury, N.T. Wright, he refers to this story as the finest scene that Luke, the Gospel writer, has ever sketched. He says that the level of drama, it has everything anybody could ever want. It has sorrow. Suspense, puzzlement, gradual drawing of light, and then in the second act, unexpected actions happen. Astonished recognition, a flurry of excitement and activity. And he's not wrong. Perhaps more than any other piece of Scripture that we hear in this place on Sunday morning, it's this one that can paint for us a clear picture of what's going on as the disciples walk alongside the road. It's a story like any other And at the same time, a story unlike any other, all at once. Imagine, if you will, 
what it would have been like to be in those disciples' shoes as they're walking that long seven-mile, perhaps even dangerous journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Terrible roads, no public transportation, no pavement. You had just been into the city for the most holy week of the year, and yet the most unholy thing just happened. Your teacher, your leader, the long-expected Savior of your people was put to death in the most horrific way imaginable, and now you're left with nothing. You feel empty. Your mind is confused. Your heart has a sadness that it's never quite had before, and at the same time, you feel compelled to talk with each other about it. Maybe you're just trying to process everything that just occurred Or maybe deep down you know that there's something more to be learned. As you're walking, a stranger joins you along the way. To your surprise, this stranger knows nothing of what happened in the city over the last few days, and at the same time, he shares something with you. He shares your story. The story of your faith. He doesn't just share it. He knows it by heart. He believes it in here. He lives it. And as he starts talking, you lock in to his words and you begin thinking to yourself, this is my story. The story of my faith. A story that seems so ordinary for all of my life. I've heard it over and over and over again. It's just like any other tale that my parents have taught me. And now this stranger comes upon us and tells me about it in a new way. A way that I've never heard before. As you continue listening, you feel an openness about the Scriptures, a sense of comfort in that story that you've never experienced before. Your curiosity is piqued. Your imagination is running wild. Your story is alive in a new and exciting way, and you want more. You're so enamored with the words that are coming from the stranger that you didn't even notice you had arrived at your destination and that the light is drawing dim. As you're about to walk through your front door and the stranger begins to head off into the village, something inside you tells you to shout out to him. Come back, you say. It's getting dark. You'd better stay with us for the evening. It could be dangerous out there. And as the stranger turns around to take you up on your offer, your stomach drops because you didn't think he could possibly say yes to your invitation. You're wondering who you're listening to. And yet because of the teachings about love and compassion and grace, the teachings that were given to you by your teacher, the one who died on the cross three days ago, you have an odd sense of comfort and peace in your decision to welcome the stranger into your home. And you walk through the front door, you drop your bags, take a sip of water, give your family members a hug, and then you begin preparing the meal. As you prepare, you notice that off in the corner, the stranger's sitting there all alone. Just as about the time you're trying to draw him into conversation for fear that you're not being welcoming enough, you realize that he's not over there in the corner because he feels unwelcome, but because he needs a moment of peace. You see, he's praying. And as he's praying, you hear him softly say some familiar words, words that you heard on the mountaintop so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. At first you're surprised because how could this stranger know that prayer, that that prayer was taught to us by Jesus and we're his disciples and that stranger was not among us that day, but then you remember the day. Remember the hundreds of people surrounding the mountain that were compelled by your teacher and his amazing voice and all that he was teaching. And then you think to yourself, maybe it's not that far-fetched that this guy knows the prayer. You sit down to begin the meal. Just as you you have settled in at the table, the stranger gets up from the corner and softly and gently and with a little bit of grace sits down next to you at the table and asks you for the bread. You think that's odd, that he's asking for the bread. With all of these things on the table, why would he ask for this ordinary loaf of bread? And as you hand it to him, your curiosity gets the best of you. You ask, why do you want this bread? Of all these delicious things in front of you, why do you want this bread? As you hand it to him, he looks at you in the eyes 
smiles, and then looks towards the sky and begins to pray. We pray You, gracious Father, send Your Spirit upon this bread that it might be blessed and that we might be united to each other. Who is this man you're shouting in your mind? What is he doing? How does he know that prayer? Is he playing a sick joke on us? And the stranger then breaks the bread and he looks back at you and hands it to you and says, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Your jaw nearly hits the table and you realize for the first time that it's no stranger sitting right next to you, but it's Jesus Himself. The one you'd been searching for for three days and you think, how could I not recognize Him? As tears begin to well up in your eyes and as you jump up to embrace Jesus in a big hug, He vanishes. Into thin air, He disappears. You're happy, yet sad. You're full of newfound energy and yet feeling empty. You're full of knowledge and left feeling confused all at once. Everyone around you is in disbelief and chaotic chatter, but for some reason, as you reflect on what just happened, a sense of peace comes over you. Peace as you remember the words that he said while he was blessing the bread. Bless this bread that it might unite us together. Do this in remembrance of me. It's in that moment you finally see that your eyes are opened. You see with clarity that the ordinary stranger walking along with you who shared your ordinary story was unlike any ordinary stranger at all sharing any ordinary story because he was the story. He is the story. As you look down at your ordinary table, you see that it's anything but ordinary. Just the same is true for the loaf of bread that you're still holding in your hands in amazement. What was once like any other loaf of bread is now unlike any loaf of bread because Jesus has broken it here in the presence of community and now the living God is fully present right there in your hands. God is here. Jesus is alive, you shout to the rest of your family. He's right here even though He's vanished, He's here. Your family looks at you in dazed and confusement. Something in your mind triggers again, and your eyes are opened yet again. You realize that maybe, just maybe, you didn't recognize Jesus before because you failed to believe your own story. The one that seems so ordinary. The one that's just like any other story, the one that you've been hearing your whole life, the story that the not-so-ordinary stranger told you along the way, the story that Jesus taught you but three days ago when He was with you and your friends, the story that you're now a living part of. And all of a sudden, you don't just see, but you know. Know that it is not just any ordinary story. It's unlike any story at all because now you know that you and your people are truly free. Now you know that a new way of life, the way of life that Jesus has promised, is unfolding right before your very eyes. And because you know, you can't help but want to tell. Tell others so that they can see as well that the Lord is risen indeed and that a new way of life, a new way of freedom, a new way of love, It's about to begin. Now that we are on the other side of the day of resurrection, on the other side of our Lenten disciplines of six long weeks, on the other side of that deep spiritual connection that Holy Week can provide for us, we might feel as though we're falling back into our old and ordinary ways of life. And I can completely understand that feeling. So much of what we do here as a people of faith may seem ordinary, so mundane, so repetitive. But that story, our story, reminds us that what we do, how we live and celebrate the risen Lord is unlike anything else that we do. Unlike anything else that the world does. And that's precisely what makes this story exceptional, outstanding, 
unlike anything else there is. It what is it's what makes us a sacramental of faith that is based upon the exceptional story of Scripture. Without the sacraments tied to Scripture, the sacraments can seem like magic tricks, and without Scripture tied to sacraments, the Scripture can seem like an exercise in reading difficult literature at best. But the two paired together, knit together, they provide for something healing, for something restorative, for something life-giving. And because they do that, like Jesus broke bread with his friends in that story today, we should be compelled to do that too. To break bread with others. Then to give it away. And then seek to coming back here over and over again to be re-energized again and then go back out into the world and do it all over again. And we do that because this is how we come to know the living presence of God. The same presence that was right there in the hands of the disciples. Our story and the way we live and the things we do, they don't always make sense, especially if we only do them every once in a while. But if you make them a discipline, if you're intentional, if you dedicate yourself to learning our story, coming here to break bread with community and then give yourself away in the same kind of love that Jesus gave, this life we lead has the opportunity to shape you into the person God is calling you to be. And if you run to tell the story like Mary and Peter and John and the disciples in the story for today, if you run to share that story, this story has the chance to shape somebody else into the person God is calling them to be as well. It's a story like any other and unlike any other all at once. And because of that, it makes us a people like any other and unlike any other all at once. Welcome to this season of Easter, my friends. Welcome to experiencing, living, and learning the ordinary story of our faith so that we can be transformed into the unordinary people that God is asking us to be. Amen. I invite you to stand as you are able, and together let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, He is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets, 
We believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Prayers of the people. Rejoicing in the risen presence of Christ, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Risen Lord, hear our prayer. For the whole bright earth, so lovingly created, yet so compassionately redeemed, that it may speak again of the glory and majesty of God, let us pray to the Lord. For all nations and the peoples of the earth, to whom God shows no partiality, that all may be transformed by mercy to live together in hope, let us pray to the Lord. For the Holy Church, that in all this diversity, witness may be made by one Lord, one faith, one baptism, let us pray to the Lord. For all in high places of authority, for whom Christ was put to death and raised, that they may be led to govern with equality and justice, bringing life to those in the shadow of death, let us pray to the Lord. For all who have been baptized and given the garments of light, that they may with the whole church may be witness to the gospel in daily life. Let us pray to the Lord. For all captives, prisoners, and those condemned to die with whom the Holy One shares suffering and abandonment, that they may find strength, freedom, and forgiveness. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who suffered in mind, body, or soul, for whom Christ is risen with healing in his glorious wings, that they may be comforted. We pray especially for Beth Herr, Jim Wilsonberg, Bill Keaton, Sandra Livet, Bruce Fisher, David Cooley, Ted, you, those we name in this time, please pause and think. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who have died and for all who grieve, that in Christ who triumphs over death, they may find light perpetual and blessed assurance. We pray especially for Evelyn Powers, Billy Carter, those we name at this time. Let us pray to the Lord. For we'll all gathered together today, whether in this assembly or at home, that we, like Mary and Peter and John, may see the tomb empty and joyfully believing, walk in newness of life. Let us pray to the Lord. Risen Lord, in whom we are raised to new life. As we offer you these prayers and petitions, help us also to offer ourselves for the service of others, that we may bear marks of new life in the world and be signs of a new creation. In your holy name, amen. amen. My sisters, my brothers, my friends in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
Good morning, everyone. You did much better than 8 o'clock. Wow, they were asleep this morning. My goodness. I'm glad you're here. Thank you for worshiping with us. And if you're a newcomer, thank you for coming to Grace this morning. Our vestry person today is Matt Chamberlain. Is Matt? There, there's Matt. Um, if you have thoughts or questions after the service, or if you're a newcomer, please find Matt so that he can get those things down and we can learn about who you are and how best to serve you and your family. A couple of announcements to work through, uh, but before I talk about the announcements, um, I'd like to invite anybody who is in this the six sacred ground circle to make your way forward. We're going to do a commissioning after the announcements. And the twins are trapping somebody in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on forward, and because and, I don't have a lot of announcements, so I just want you to start getting in place while I, I talk. Um, we have a lot of things coming up here at Grace, uh, of which are some wonderful speakers and speaking opportunities that we have for you to take part of, the first of which happens tomorrow evening in the parish hall at 7. We've invited uh, Moms Demand Action to be here to help us um, talk about the, the plague of gun violence here in our country and about what we can do about it. So please come on out. Please support this. There's a few flyers in the back if you want to grab one and hand them out to family or friends or whoever. It's a great way that we can take action and, and help fix the, the plague that is gun violence in our country. So thank you in advance for, um, for supporting that and, and for doing all that you do. The second speaker is Williamsburg Community Growers, and they're going to be here next Sunday at 9. So in between services, they'll be in the parish hall, and they'll be talking about the ways in which they use the funding that we've been providing them this month. Remember, there are Thanksgiving basket for this month. So come out and grab a cup of coffee early before church. I know 9 o'clock's early for you all, but it's okay. <laughs> come on out and um, listen to what they have to say and all the good work that they're doing for our community, because it really is good work, and you're helping to support that. So thank you. Now, without further ado, shall we commission you folks? <laughs> are you scared? Are you nervous? Yeah. I don't know, should you? <laughs> All right, so let us pray. Dear people of God, we stand in the shadow of prophets crying out for justice and peace. God calls us to be a people of reconciliation, serving a world in need. Courageous women and men have taken the risk of standing up and speaking out for the least and the lowest. This work involves risking ourselves for the sake of God's love, moving beyond ourselves in order to seek and serve Christ and one another. We are called to do the work and ministry of social justice and reconciliation. Janet Stevens, Myrna Herv, Deb Hotelling, Lynn Lubinsky, Celia Wilson, Gretchen Martin, Giselle Carter, Elizabeth Randolph, and Barbara Mori, you have been called to be ministers of this work through your participation and engagement with sacred ground. And together you will be making up the sixth sacred ground circle of Grace Church. I ask you to take this calling with seriousness and with honor so that you may help to form God's world into the beloved community that we are meant to be. As you do this work, I implore you to remember your baptismal promises to seek and to serve, to strive for justice and peace, to mend what is broken by human sin and to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Be open be honest, and be willing to be changed by and through the love of God. In the name of God and of this church, I commission you to stand up, speak out, and live into the reign of Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. And Diana and Laura are our instructors, and they've gone through sacred ground. All yeah, they're, yeah. Thank you all for doing that. Thank you all. You're officially commissioned. Thank you. And again, one of the ways that we can be beloved communities coming out to support things like Moms Demand Action and all of the speakers that we um, have chosen for our Thanksgiving basket because that's part of the work we're called to do as Christians. So again, thank you in advance for that and for your generosity. And at this time, we'll bring the Thanksgiving basket around. Remember that um, everything in the Thanksgiving basket goes straight to the uh, community growers this month. And then the second offering is for the operating needs of the church. All right, can we start us off? Thank you. 
As always, thank you for your love and your service and your smiles that you bring to Grace and Suzanne. Thank you for all you do to make Grace what it is. St. Paul says, Each of you should give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. There we go.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bowed to praise you for your glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. And therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, and your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
gifts of God for the people of God, the holy things for the holy ones. You may be seated.
God, 
Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, remember that life is short and we have too little time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be quick to be kind, make haste to love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us sing out, my friends. Hymn 296. to take your bulletins home today. Faith at home is back in them. And let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia.
Jesus.